Now the um, so we have the first movement, which is really uh, risen from Napoleon. Then the idea fails, uh, or Napoleon fails, not the idea. And then uh, the funeral march. Uh, we have skirts, so, and then the fourth movement, the big enigma, really. Mm -hmm. Well, the first, the, it's very clear from the sketches that the first, the fourth movement is the first that he thought of. Mm -hmm. uh, he started uh, sketching that uh, right after the what he what piece that he called the Prometheus variations, which mm -hmm. are piano variations, Opus Thirty Five. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we now call them the Eroica variations because mm -hmm. we sort of take the name from the later symphony. But it's in eighteen o two that he's um, finished with the uh, with those pieces, and in the same sketchbook he certainly has an idea for an E-flat symphony. Mm -hmm. And um, the second symphony is already done, so he's, he's working, he's, he's planning a third one. And um, what's kind of interesting is that there are sketches for an E-flat symphony, but they do not include uh, the theme from the fourth movement as we know it. Mm -hmm. And that's perfectly reasonable because he already has a sketch for it. It's the, it's the piano piece that he just finished. I see. So it's, but, it's clear that it was there from the beginning. But he doesn't follow anything uh, resembling uh, a typical sonata mm -hmm. rondo form no, that would be the fourth movement in a, right. in a symphony. Right. We don't have a name for the format that he uses. Not but really. We have and, two yeah. fugue sections and then mm -hmm. there is this andante section that mm -hmm. with the beautiful oboe yeah. solos mm -hmm. and all so forth. Uh, but it's an interesting piece in its format. Yes. It, it is. It's, um, it, it has the idea of having the theme as a culmination, which was what happened in the, uh, in the piano variations. And he uses that idea a few times, right? The seventh mm -hmm. symphony. Mm -hmm. You have to, the slow movement of the seventh symphony, you have to work through it until you finally get the melody in the violins. Yes. And of course, the ninth symphony finale of right. tune doesn't right. show up until builds later. Up, builds up until finally it's unveiled. And in so this works that way. Interestingly enough, yes, but, but it, from my point of view, and it's just mm -hmm. my point of view, it's not mm -hmm. a theory of any kind, but uh, he reflects the human human chaos mm. that only through the piece somewhere at the end finds its way. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the Eroica as a concept and the, the Napoleon then failing and then so forth, mm -hmm. then at the end we find the, the most human movement of the symphony <laughs> being the fourth one, the most chaotic one. That's true. But the one the that builds time. itself up from the beginning. Exactly. As, as, uh, as we were saying, is exactly. Beethoven's life and also is... Uh, it's a fascinating combination. Now, yeah. um, our listeners, our viewers, uh, perhaps uh, need an explanation what this, what a symphony is. And I left that question for the end uh, on purpose, because, you know, um, uh, we have to sort of enclose what we were talking about. And many composers, many great artists r tried to write a symphony. Few succeeded. Mm. Very few. Mm. Uh, why? Well, what is the symphony? Mm. Well, Mahler told us it was a universe. That doesn't help too much. It just makes another metaphor for it. I buy that. Uh, <laughs> I buy that. But um, you, you have you have lots of opposing forces. You have the idea of variety at the same time as you want some kind of unity. If you put too much unity, you get monotony, as, right. as they often say. Uh, so there's a, a tremendous balance that's that's necessary. Which is a necessary thing in the universe. Mm -hmm. I would think so. Uh, one, there's also a... a you know, one of the things about the classical music tradition is that it's not a naive tradition. You don't write a symphony until you, ideally, until you know an awful lot about the symphonies before you. Mm -hmm. um, and the history of the symphony is so rich that in order to write something, I mean, even in the 18th century it was rich, of course, the Haydn mm -hmm. and the Mozart symphonies, okay. um, that to write something that wasn't naive or to write something that did not speak to uh, uh, the pieces before as part of that tradition. Um, if, you, if you do that, if, if you make it not speak to the tradition, then it's isolated and it doesn't mm -hmm. belong. Mm -hmm. I think one of the aspects of symphonic literature that's often neglected is, is how symphonies 
really do clearly refer to each other. I mean, the um, mm -hmm. think of the the Rhenish Symphony. The Rhenish Symphony by Schumann clearly is relating to the Eroica in yeah. many ways. And the Brahms Third quotes the Rhenish. It's part of that same sort of yeah. tradition. So not knowing the Schumann uh, Rhenish Symphony uh, takes away from what you might get from the from the Brahms. And um, and not only that, but not understanding those pieces stops you as a composer from writing a piece that belongs in that tradition. The knowledge of the listener. Mm -hmm. well, obviously, you mentioned a very interesting aspect of it because um, the listener must know also what he or she is listening to. Mm -hmm. In fact, part of this program is, is an attempt to, in a way, educate, not in, mm -hmm. not in academic sense, but in sense of communication with, with our listeners, the orchestra listeners. But um, uh, if you say the composer must know it, how much of that the audience must know? Mm -hmm. Well, the more the audience knows, the more valuable the piece is, the more enhanced the experience of the piece is. Mm -hmm. You have to start somewhere, of course, and so yes. you can't... Um, I mean, that's, that's one of the difficult things about um, educating in, in the classical tradition, you know, classical musical tradition, is that, you know, you do start somewhere and one understands that the first few pieces that one learns, uh, you, the, the listener doesn't have that kind of multi-connected background right. necessarily. But uh, the joy comes as you learn more and more pieces and you make these larger connections. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we translate that into, uh, into sort of um, a process that is for everybody? In other words, we do face a situation in which majority of society, majority of, uh, I mean, most of the people don't have that. Mm -hmm. And don't have the experience, don't have the knowledge, and perhaps we can blame this or that, but that's irrelevant mm -hmm. to right. the point. Sure. But music also has to defend itself by, it, by its beauty. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do we start educating people? What do we tell, what do we say to people who never been to the uh, to Beethoven's Eroica performance. Mm -hmm. What is there for them? Well, you, you won't expect um, that, uh, that audience to get as much out of it mm -hmm. as, as an audience that knows the Mozart or, and knows the Haydn repertory. Um, but I, you, I think you put, hit the nail on the head when you said the intrinsic beauty of the piece um, is at least one aspect of the piece that you don't need to be prepared for. Right. Um, I think uh, asking people to to listen hard and to have confidence in what their in what their abilities to hear are. Um, in music classrooms, we make explicit connections, and I'm sure in your preparation uh, for a performance, you may remind uh, your players about this has to sound like this, or I'm going to make sure that this uh, has a relationship like that, because uh, the great part of the tradition involves uh, what we would call thematic or motivic connections among the... Uh, and historical uh, yes. connections, yes. in other words, both both without generations. Outside the piece and, yes. and within the piece. Um, and the Eroica is certainly a, a, a giant step in creating the different movements that are all cut from the same cloth. Right. Okay. Uh, they don't seem to be that way at first. Otherwise, it would it would sound monotonous if it's the same tune over and over again. But as one gets to, I guess a, a good piece of advice might be when you hear something within a symphony, and it sounds familiar, and it sounds appropriate, and it sounds like just the right thing, then it's probably because you are somehow hearing it relate to something you've heard earlier, mm -hmm. sort of preparation for it. So you have to subject yourself to these directions, to these uh, uh, impulses. And I think so, and you, and, the, and, you, and you let your ears tell you. You don't need yeah. paper and pencil, and you don't exactly. need somebody to tell you these things. Um, and and you want it to be. You'd rather it be something that you hear than something that you're told about or read about. Yes. Uh, so the the ideal way is to. Uh, let the music tell you what it's going to do and mm -hmm. put a certain amount of confidence in yourself mm -hmm. as long as you work, as long as you listen hard, as long as you uh, concentrate. Because the, the music is meant for that. It's, it wasn't, people didn't distribute scores at concerts and, right. and people didn't lecture about pieces. Um, so um, the music has to be able to... Um, it's one of the things, I think, in, that's crucial in symphonic writing uh, that we were starting to talk about earlier yes. uh, is that... Um, 
is that a composer has to make the piece communicate. If he's got all these wonderful ideas and, and nobody can hear them, then, then what good is it? Uh, so the, the, the ability for a, a symphony to communicate, uh, even with someone listening hard uh, without having studied it, uh, that's a great achievement. Well, I thank you very much for a very uh, inspirational oh. conversation. Oh, thank and you. And perhaps uh, you'll visit our studio again. Oh, I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.